excited about this day, excited about the fact that we get to uh, baptize some folks this morning that can relate to that. They could relate to that last Sunday before the invitation, but they can relate to it this Sunday. I don't know about y'all, but I'm looking forward to singing uh, He Touched Me sometime. Uh, you know, glory, 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 uh, somebody touched me. And uh, looking forward to that because we get some folks to stand up again and uh, some folks that couldn't stand up when we did it last time. And so we're thankful for that. If you would, I want you to look at Luke chapter 23 this morning. And if you would find verse 39 and keep your Bibles open. Um, this is such an amazing passage of Scripture this morning. And uh, we've been looking at saints and sinners uh, that are found in the Scriptures. And this is one of those rare occasions where we find both of them showing up at the same time in the same place so we can look at them and compare them. And the title of the message today, uh, I'm dealing with the thieves that were on the cross there uh, with Jesus Christ whenever he was crucified. And I, I just simply want to call this, what made the difference between a saint and sinner? What made the difference between a saint and a sinner? And so if you would stand to your feet as we read the Word of God this morning. And please keep your Bibles open as again we'll be looking at a lot of this comes out of this chapter. I've got one or two other places in Luke I might have you turn this morning, but uh, this is such an amazing passage. It settles once and for all what it takes to get to heaven. Yeah. And uh, in the most simple childlike terms you can possibly imagine. The Bible says in Luke 23, 39, and one of the male factors, which would have been the thieves, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Boy, I like that, don't you? The Bible says in verse 42, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you at this time thanking you, Lord, for this simple passage that will teach us such profound truths about salvation today. Father God, help me, Lord, to preach this. I need to be emptied of all of me that there is and filled with your Holy Spirit. Father God, I pray for guidance and leadership. I pray for a touch of power. And I pray, God, that you would just help me, Lord, to relay this information in the simplest of terms. And Father, I pray, God, that if there be anybody here today that their soul is hanging in the balance between heaven and hell, Father, they're lifted in between that, that place of hell and that place of heaven just like these two thieves were. Then, Father, they'll do what the one thief did. And that's put the full faith and trust that they have in your Son, Jesus Christ, for the salvation of their soul. We thank you, Lord God, that we have this book that clears up everything that we need to know about salvation. We thank you that you did not make it complicated today, but you made it so simple that a child could understand it. And Father, we thank you that you did that because you want us to be with you. We thank you, Lord, that your son died for us on Calvary. We thank you for the shed blood. We thank you, Lord, that we serve a risen Savior, not a dead man or a dead prophet or a dead priest, but a living God today. And Father, we put our faith and trust in you to take us through this time that you would continue to save souls and change lives. And Father, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. As we look at this again, we come to a scene now where, if you could imagine, Mount Calvary is there, the place of the skull. It looks like literally like a skull over there just outside the gates of Jerusalem. And we've got this scene now at the place of the skull and at the bottom of it, you find the intersection of the Damascus Road and the Jericho Road, the two most heavily traveled roads at that time. And so in other words, whenever this event took place, if you would, it would have been at a time and a place where the most people could see it. I, I believe there's a reason for that. I believe God wanted as many people as He could possibly get there that day so they could see exactly what it took for an individual to get to heaven. Yep. And so you've got there this intersection. Probably a thousand or more, if not several thousand, would have been gathered there that day to watch this event. And so they're all gathered around Mount Calvary and up on Mount Calvary 
You see three crosses. There was one cross that had a thief on it. And there's another cross that had a thief on it. And in the middle of the two crosses, you find the very Son of the living God. We're talking about the perfect Son of God. We're talking about the powerful Son of God. We're talking about the most precious Son of God. And there He is in between these two men as that great dividing line, if you would. By the way, He still divides today, doesn't He? He divides the dead, makes the difference between heaven and hell. He makes the difference between belief and unbelief. He makes the difference between repentance and rejection. And that's exactly what went on there. On one side, you've got a thief that looked to the Savior and received the Savior and he went to heaven. But on the other side, you've got a thief that rebuked the Savior. And when he did, he rejected the Savior and he died in his sin and went to hell. Hey, what made the difference, though, between the one and the other? Why did one go to heaven and the other go to hell? Well, we find that here in this passage so simple that a child can understand it. Number one, notice the appeal of the criminals. The appeal of the criminals. Now, I want you to think about this with me for a moment. You've got two men that are literally in the same location. They are around the same Savior. They are experiencing the same events. They are hearing the same words that are spoken by Him. They are there with the same situation. There's no difference in the environment. There's no difference in what they're experiencing. But still yet, you've got one that rejected Christ and went to hell. And you've got another that received Christ and went to heaven. You know, how is that even possible? How does that even happen? How is it that here on a Sunday morning you can have two people sitting side by side lost and they're hearing the same sermon and they're hearing the same songs and they're in the same service and still yet one will get up out of their seat and walk it out and get saved by the grace of God and the other will get up and walk out and be lost in their sin. How is that possible? Well, I'm going to show you this morning. Number one, if you'll notice here, the thief, the first thief I want to cover is found in verse 39. Number one, if you'll notice this, we've got a thief that appealed to Christ uh, in, in this particular passage. Uh, and we're going to look at the other thief that appealed to Christ in the other passage. But we've got this thief here that basically wanted to be rescued from his situation. He wanted to be rescued from his situation. In verse 39 there, we find him appealing to the Lord Jesus Christ. We find him looking to the man that's in the middle. By the way, there's only one mediator between God and man. Amen. And that is the man, Christ Jesus. And so there he is. And you find this man is now looking at Jesus. And he appeals to him for, for uh, uh, a, 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 if you would, a delivery there, if you would. He wants to be removed from his situation. He wants to be uh, taken out of that situation. Now, there's three things we've got to understand about that. Three things that are very important here. Number one, if you'll notice here, this particular man was unconcerned. Now, watch this. He says here in verse 39, he says, And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him. So you got a man here that is, is actually unconcerned about his spiritual condition. We know this, if he was concerned about his spiritual condition, he wouldn't have looked to Jesus Christ and railed on him and, and began to rebuke him and fuss at him the way he did. Now, this man does not want to be redeemed. He wants to be rescued. He's not sorry that he's a sinner He's sorry for the sentence that he's experiencing at this point. Right. Now, now, I said all that to say this. you got a man here that is now dying the same way he lived. He had no room for Christ in his heart. He had no reverence for Christ in his life. He had no respect for Christ. He had no receiving of Christ. He's just mad because he's in a situation he does not want to be in. He is unconcerned with where he's going. We know the clock is ticking on this man. We know that by the end of this day when the sun goes down, this man is going to die. I don't know about you, but if I was in that situation, I'd want to make sure I was not going to hell when I died. But this man, he's unconcerned about his situation. He's unconcerned about his soul. I, how many times 
have we talked to an individual about their soul, Bruce? And when we talk to them, we'll say, where are you going when you die? And they'll say, I'm going to hell. Would you like to get saved? No, not today. Yep. Yeah. Are you kidding me? If you were concerned about going to hell, you would sure do something about it. Right. The yeah. problem is, is you're unconcerned about where your soul is going to spend eternity. Hell is not real or you do something about it. Yeah. I tell you this, if I had a cage right here and I said I'm going to bring you up and I'm going to put you in that cage and I'm going to hose you down with a flammable liquid and I'm going to light you on fire and I'm going to watch you burn. And there's only one way for you not to burn in this cage today. And that is for you to walk across the street over to the gas station, open up the bathroom door and lick that toilet clean. I guarantee you one thing, you go over and lick that toilet clean until it looked like it was on the showroom floor so you would not burn in that cage. Amen. Now let me tell you something. There's a hell that is eternal and it will burn you for all of eternity. Amen. Not just for a while. And if you don't get saved, you're going to go there to burn for all of eternity. And yet there's people that hear that and they're unconcerned. Right. This man's unconcerned. Number two, you'll find out he's unbelieving. Look down here in verse uh, 39 again. It says that he railed on him. That shows he's unconcerned. And then he says this, If thou be the Christ. In other words, he's unbelieving. You know, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, in chapter 21, it says that the fearful and the unbelieving will be cast into the lake of fire. Those people that just don't believe. Why they know who Jesus is, they know what he did on the cross, but they just refuse to believe. And this man here, he's saying, if, if you're really who you say you are, he's unbelievable. Well, let me ask you a question. I don't know about you, but that sounds awful familiar to me. Yep. I don't believe this man got that of his own accord. I believe he got it from somewhere else. Let me show you where he got it from. Number one, if you look down here in verse 35. It says, and the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ. So we see two groups of people that he heard say this as he was hanging there on the cross. Whenever you look at this, you'll find out, number one, that there was a group that was rebellious. It was that group of people that was there at the foot of the cross and around that area at the intersection of the Damascus and the Jericho Road. It says that the people were there, a rebellious crowd that said, if you're really who you say you are. But then we find there's a religious crowd. The rulers, the chief priests were there. And they said the same thing with them. Hey, if you're really who you say you are, then do what you said you could do. But then we find the ruthless. Look down in the next verse here. In verse 36, the Bible said, And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews. So we find not only is there a rebellious crowd, and not only is there a religious crowd that's, that's questioning him, but there's a ruthless crowd. These soldiers were the most ruthless and evil and vile people that you could ever imagine. They took great pleasure in doing what they did that day. But I'm going to tell you, I don't believe any of them got it originally. I believe there's a ruler, a ruler of darkness, from way back that gave all of them that idea. Right. You say, why, who is it? Go over with me to Luke chapter 4 and I'll show you. <coughs> Notice Luke chapter 4. <coughs> Luke chapter 4. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4, verse 3, And the devil said unto him, talking about the Christ, If thou be the Son of God. Look down at verse 9. 
And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God. I'm going to tell you what was going on there that day. You find now that in this particular place, you've got rebellious people, you've got religious people, you've got ruthless people, and all of them in unison are saying the same thing. But behind the curtain, way back there in the darkness, you find an individual by the devil himself that is putting this in the hearts and the minds of each one of those groups of people and getting them to question who the Son of the living God really is. And by the way, that's not stopped still yet to this day. The same groups are still doing the same thing. You've got that rebellious crowd. I'm talking about the atheists and the agnostics and the evolutionists. And they're pointing a finger saying, hey, if he's really the son of God, then why does he let the little baby suffer? Why does he let this happen and let that happen? You've got the religious crowd. I'm talking about the Islamic group. I'm talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm talking about the Mormons. I'm talking about the Buddhists and the Hindus that keep pointing the finger saying if he's really the son of God then why is this happening or what is this belief in our books what's the difference and then you've got that, that, that ruthless crowd I'm talking about the people that party and want to live out in the prison setting and all that they're pointing the finger saying if he's really who he says he is right. and no, now we've got a, a devil that has created an entire generation of people that are pointing a finger at Jesus and saying, if you're really who you say you are, if that's really true, if He's really the only way, then why do we have all these other religions? If He's really the only way, why do we keep coming up with these dates that are a couple million years old? How did He create everything? And, and, and you create this doubt. There's unbelief that's there. But then I find also in this same verse, if you look back in verse 39... He said, save thyself and us. We find out he's unrepentant. He was not the least bit concerned about being saved from his sin. He wanted to be saved from his sins. <coughs> Can I tell you, you'll never get saved until you're ready to get saved from your sin. Right. How many times have we seen people come through these the, the, the doors of this church and they'll come down to an altar and they cry these big crocodile tears and then when they get up and they go get baptized or whatever and then whenever their, 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 their circumstance is over their situation is fixed then you do not see them darken the doors of God's house anymore. i tell you what the problem was. They didn't come down to get saved from their sin. They came to get saved from their situation and that's not salvation at all. Amen. Jerry Vines told this story he said there was a young man. He was in trouble with the law. And whenever he came into uh, their church, he came down to the altar. He took a Bible. Jerry Vines took a Bible and went through the Scriptures with him. Told him how to get saved. Told him about Christ, about repentance and all that. He made a profession of faith. And when he got up from the altar, he got baptized. He became a church member. He attended church every service until his trial day. And when the trial was over, he was acquitted of the crimes that they were trying to uh, 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 convict him of. And so he had no jail time to serve. And Jerry Vines said this, down in Jacksonville, Florida, he said, I never saw that man come through the doors of our church again after they let him off there in that court. He said this, he said that man never got saved to start with because he wasn't getting saved from his sin. He was getting saved from his situation. And God does not always save you from your situation. But thank God if you come with a repentant heart, He'll save you from your sin and write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yeah. But it can't be about your situation. Yep. Don't come and, and treat God like a spare tire yeah. when your life goes flat. Come on. Don't come and treat God like He's some kind of a thirst quencher whenever you've got a thirst in your life. You need to come and get saved because you want to be saved from who and what you are, not from what you've done. Amen. Amen. And so we find out he is unrepentant. But now we go and we look at this other guy. There's a big difference between the, the first thief now and the second thief. Look with me now in verse 40. And we'll find that there's a thief that's now come not to be rescued, but to be redeemed. You'll notice that this man never asked one time to be taken off the cross. He never asked one time to be delivered from the pain. So let's look and see what he did. In verses 40 through 42, we'll notice 
that his focus had changed. Down in verse 40, the Bible says, but the other answering rebuked him. Now, that's important because I want you to turn with me real quick to Matthew 27. I want to show you the, what, the way this man started out. Turn with me real quick to Matthew 27. got one thief that came to get rescued, but you got another one that came to get redeemed. Now notice what he starts out saying. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. So both of them started out saying what this thief said in verse 39 of our text today. And now, all of a sudden, we find that his focus had changed. He's now rebuking that guy. He started out teaming up with him on Christ, and now he's, he's, he's suddenly got a different attitude. Now, I, I wonder how that happens. How do you got two guys that start out exactly the same? One of, uh, both of them are, 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 are accusing Christ of the same things, pointing a finger at Christ and saying the same evil things, and then yet suddenly, one of them starts changing his tune. I'm going to show you why I think that happened. Go with me back to Luke 23 now. I think he finally come to terms with some things. Number one, he saw a man who cared. Now watch this in verse 27. The Bible says in their fathers, Luke 23, 27, and there followed him a great company of people and of the women which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turning unto them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. So if you can picture now, you've got this line of people carrying their cross up to Mount Calvary. And in that line at the beginning is Christ and these uh, thieves are right behind him and they're carrying that cross and they're walking along and here Jesus is beat to a bloody pulp. His flesh is literally ripped from the bone from the whip that he took and he looks over and sees a group of women that are crying over him. And whenever he sees them, he cares enough about them to say, listen, don't weep for me. You need to weep for yourselves. And he shows them care. Can you imagine that man? He's carrying his cross and he hears that. And he sees that man in the midst of all that agony and all that pain. And he cares about somebody. And that man says this. He said, how in the world can he care for them? I've never had anybody care for me like that before. There's a lot of people that don't realize that there's somebody out there that does care for them. They've been discarded all of their life. Nobody's wanted them. Nobody's cared about them. They've been cast off here and cast off there. And nobody's ever given a, a, a hoot about who they were or what they were. And listen, they forget that there is a God that actually does care about them. I don't know about you, but I sure am glad that there's a God that cares for my soul and cares for your soul. This man saw somebody that finally cared for. Yes. But number two, he saw not only care, but he saw compassion. Look at verse 34. Jesus is hanging on the cross and there's a thief hanging and another thief hanging. And listen to what they heard. The first thing comes out of Jesus' mouth now. In verse 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He finds a man now that has compassion. He doesn't just care, but he has compassion. You know, the Bible says that Jesus looked out upon the multitudes with compassion. You know what Jesus is saying right here this morning when He looks out all over this congregation? He looks out with you with compassion. He does not want to damn you to hell. He wants to deliver your soul and take you to be in heaven with Him. He has compassion. This man very likely had never experienced compassion in his life. He was probably a product of his environment. And nobody ever showed him any compassion. He might have had a daddy that beat him. He might have had a mama that, that did not want anything to do with him. He might have had some aunts and uncles that might have abused him. He might have had nobody in his life that ever showed him an ounce of compassion. But now, in the midst of this time of terror and torment, he sees a man that has compassion. But then he sees a caption. Look down at verse 38. Hanging over this man's head is an amazing statement. At the end, in all caps, are seven words. This is the king of the Jews. Amen. He realized this man was no common criminal. 
But this was a king that had a kingdom. He knew there was something different about him. And for that, his focus now began to change. So that leads to the next thing you need to get saved. Not only does your focus need to change, but number two, a fear had to come. Look out at verse 40 if you would. The Bible says, But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou what? Fear God. Fear God. You know, the Bible says this, that the fear of God is, or fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The Bible says to fear the Lord is to hate evil. And now all of a sudden you've got a man that had lived a life of sin, a man who very likely had murdered people and had been involved in terrible things and had never given God another thought like many of you had, like I didn't. I never gave God a thought when I was out there living in sin. Never thought about anything. But there came a day when I heard the gospel and all of a sudden there was a fear that came over me. And I knew there was a just God and a holy God that I was going to face one day in my sin. And if I did, I would die and go to hell. A fear had to come. But then number two, we find that his faults now had conviction. Look at the end, or look at the beginning of verse 41. He said, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. In other words, he's saying this, we deserve what we're getting. Right. We deserve it. We should be punished for what we've done. By the way, I will tell you this. Ain't nobody in this good that they don't deserve hell. Right. You were born dead in your trespass and sin, and everybody here deserves to die and burn in hell for all of eternity. But I sure am glad I've got a God that has compare, uh, care and compassion and, and, and wants to save you and I so we don't have to go through that and endure that for all of eternity. Yeah. Yeah. We find here that he finally got some conviction, but then there's a faith that had consideration. Now this is an amazing thing because we see several statements that he makes at this point now that line right up with just simple salvation. And watch this. Number one, he for the first time in his life has the faith to consider the sinless Son of God. He said in verse 41 at the end, but this man hath done nothing amiss. You know, Judas said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. This thief says, this man has done nothing wrong. Listen, he realized that hanging beside him was not a common criminal, but the sinless son of the living God. Amen. And by the way, if you think Jesus is like you, he'll never save you. <laughs> there had to be something different about him and about his blood and about his life. In other words, he had to be sinless. Or he's no sacrifice for your sin, is he? He's no better than you and I. Number two, he considered that the Savior is actually Jesus Christ. Look over with me in verse 42. And he said unto who? Jesus, Jesus Lord. Now, notice how he completely ignores all the religious leaders at the cross there. He never looked down at the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and said, Hey, guys, can you tell me how to get to heaven? Is there anything you can do to get me there? He doesn't look at them at all. He looks over at the one in the middle. By the way, religion will send you to hell if you look to religion to save you. Amen. You've got to look to the Redeemer. Amen. This man looked over to the Redeemer. And in a place of dying, he looked over to the one that said, He that hath life, or he that cometh to the Son hath eternal life. He looked over at the one that said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He looked over at the one that said, I am the resurrection and the life. He looked over at the one that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen, there's only one way to get to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ Himself. Amen. There's no other way. Amen. The reason is, is because He's the one that has the life. He gave a life so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. We find here the Savior is Jesus Christ. He admits that through His faith. He admits the simplicity of salvation. Notice what He says next. And He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember. Now notice He did not say anything complex there. He just simply said remember. What does He want me to remember? He's wanting, he's wanting to remember what He just said. I'm a sinner. I deserve to die. I need help. Remember that. Right? Kind of lines right up there with, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And that's what he's doing. He's calling out to the only one that could save him. He didn't go to the Pharisees, the religious crowd. He went to the one that actually do something for him. And he said one word, remember. 
Lord, remember. I said all that to say this. Satan has tried to create confusion about who the Savior is. Yep. Yeah, I know that. And he's got people looking in all kinds of different directions. He's got people looking to churches. He's got people looking to false prophets. He's got people looking to uh, some kind of religious material. He's got people looking everywhere but where they have to look. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus said this. He said, if any man come unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. Amen. So he realizes the simplicity of salvation. And then he realizes the seriousness of eternity. Notice this. It says here, and, Jesus, and he said, Jesus, Lord, remember who? Me. He didn't ask him to remember his daddy or his mama or his aunt or his uncle. It was about him at that point. You want to know why? Because he was getting ready to go into eternity. Yeah. Now, this is where I want to stop and say something. People ask me all the time, Preacher, do you believe in deathbed conversions? Yes, because we're seeing one right here. I do believe in that. Matter of fact, I've led people to the Lord on their deathbed. And they literally died within six hours of when I led them to the Lord. Now, I said all that to say this. Yes, deathbed uh, bed conversions are real. You say, but preacher, it's not fair. It's not right that I would live all my life for the Lord, get saved young and live all my life for the Lord. And then God would take me to heaven. But, but then you've got this individual that lives for hell and the devil all their life. And then they suddenly get saved at the last second and they go to heaven. That's not fair. That's not fair that they would get saved whenever they die. Well, let me tell you something. It wasn't fair when you got saved. Amen. The Bible Amen. says you were dead in your trespass and sin. Matter of fact, you were born with a death sentence. Everybody in this room is dying right now. And the difference is, is if you get saved, He'll save you from the second death. But the fact is, is you didn't even deserve to get saved either. Amen. Amen. None of us deserve salvation. Yeah. And it's not fair that God's Son died for you. Yeah. It's not fair that He burned on that cross for you. Yeah. It's not fair that He suffered that pain for you. So how dare we stand back and say it ain't fair that so-and-so got saved here and I got saved here. Hey, I'm thankful for anybody to get saved. Yeah. I don't care if they get saved on their deathbed or on a crib. Listen, thank God they got saved. Yeah. I'm glad God saved me. I'll tell you this, there's a couple times in my life before I was saved that I was right there dying myself. Dying, I mean that with all my heart. That I could have died just as sudden or more sudden really than this man because he was nailed to a cross. I never want to forget one time when I was lost and living like hell, I got uh, uh, into a, a, a scuffle with a guy and uh, we got into a car and started uh, trying to evade this guy. He was trying to run us down, me and another guy. And finally I got sick of it and I said, pull in right here at this fire department. We pulled in the fire department. I grabbed a baseball bat that I had right there in the door and I opened the door and flung it open and started at this guy with a baseball bat and met a double barrel 12 gauge shotgun in my forehead. And had that guy not realized who I was, he knew my dad, he would have killed me graveyard dead right there in that parking lot. Now that's the mercy and the grace of God. It wasn't fair that on June the 27th of 1993 that uh -huh. God gave me enough of a chance to get to an old-fashioned altar, down yeah. in an old-fashioned church, and hear the truth. Hey, thank God that God don't look at what's fair. He looks at forgiving people and saving yeah. their soul. Yeah. 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 About you, but I don't care if they get saved at 99 or they get saved at 9. It makes no difference. I led Miss Allen's mom until her how old was she when she got saved? 98? What? She's 98? 98 years old, got saved. You know what? That's a miracle of God. Amen. Because they say every year you go through life that that is a percentage off of the chance of you getting saved. She had a 98% chance of dying and going to hell. But I got a God that saw a 100% chance of writing her name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I sure am glad that it does not matter when you get saved. It matters that you get saved. Amen. But let me say this. For every one deathbed conversion I've been a part of or seen, there's probably been five that died and went to hell that didn't get saved. Yep. Yep. I had a man tell me point blank right down here at, at, uh, when the hospital was down here, tell me to my face. He was on his deathbed. He died a day later. He said, I'd rather go to hell than get saved. That's what he told me. And you know what? God obliged him. So deathbed bed professions and salvation, they're possible, but they're not probable. You better not bank on getting to your deathbed. 
Because your deathbed may meet you outside these doors today. Yeah. So we see that there. I, I want to show you something else here with this. I want you to see the sureness of the resurrection. Now watch this. He puts his faith in this. When thou comest into thy kingdom. He didn't say if. Yeah. Now you have to think about this guy. What a scene this must be. He's putting his faith in a dude that's in worse shape than him. Yeah. Now think about that. He's looking at the middle cross. And on the middle cross is a man who is stripped of all of his flesh to where the bones are literally showing. The blood is running out of this man. And he's looking at him to save him. That would be like me looking at somebody on a battlefield that got both their arms and both their legs blown off and wanting them to save me. Hey, will you carry me off the battlefield? Not likely. And here he is putting his faith in an individual that's in worse shape than him. But notice what he says. When thou comest into thy kingdom. Yes. He knew this was no ordinary man. Yep. He knew that no matter what went on there that day on the cross at Calvary, that there was coming a day when this man would not stay dead because death could not hold him. Amen. This man would have come out of the grave three days later. He knew he was going to live again. He knew that whenever he came back to life that he could do something to help this man. And that's what he put his faith in. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thank God thou shalt be saved. Amen. I sure am glad this morning I'm not counting on a dead prophet or a dead priest, or a dead person, but I've kept on a living Savior that died for my sin and rose again on the third day. Amen. That's what I'm counting on. Amen. And thank God I know He lives because He lives within my heart. Yes. Amen. I know what I've got is real because I know what He did for me. Yes. I know how He reached down in the pit of sin yes. and picked me up Amen. and saved my soul and put my feet on a solid rock and a Christ was. Because we see the appeal of the criminals, but if it stopped there, we really would be left with a big question mark, wouldn't we? But I like what the answer of Christ is in verse 43. Number one, notice the consideration of Christ. The Bible says that Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee. You know, I sure am glad he didn't do like a lot of y'all do in Walmart and ignore people. <laughs> huh? Drop. Come on now, help me out. I know you know how to escape and evade with the best of them. <laughs> down this aisle, down that aisle, go to the bathroom, act like you're in the bathroom for half a day, look out and see if you're there, you walk. You know, that ain't Jesus, though. Yeah. Jesus immediately, at that moment, acknowledged him. And he didn't just acknowledge him, he said, verily. He said this, basically, in a nutshell, he said, listen up, I got something to tell you. <laughs> yeah. I want you to listen. I want you to know what I'm about to tell you is good. <laughs> Amen. And so there's consideration. Number two, there is conversion. Notice the next word here. Today. Yeah. He didn't say tomorrow. He didn't say any other. He said today. Yeah. Amen. He said today. Let me tell you something. It's not Jesus that put your salvation off. It is the devil himself. Satan's on one side saying tomorrow. And there's Jesus on the other saying today. Amen. And you've got to make that decision. Am I coming to him today? Or am I going to wait till tomorrow? Because tomorrow may not come. Amen. Most not thyself of tomorrow. For thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. The most dangerous thing you'll ever do is walk out of this church today without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. We find not only a conversion, but we find confirmation. Notice this, it says, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, Shout thou. That's the same shout. It says, Thou shalt not, and thou shalt. And it means it's going to happen. Yeah. All the promises of God are yea, yea and amen in Christ Jesus. Now, what is he saying here? Well, first of all, he establishes once and for all the pathway of salvation. Notice that, that when he tells this man this, it eliminates four things that people try to include in your salvation. Number one, it eliminates works. 
We've got a man whose both hands and both feet are nailed to a cross. That tells me he couldn't get down and do anything. That's right. right. And I believe that was intentional. God wanted you to know that it was not works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So out goes works. Number two, out goes water. Yeah. Can't get down and get baptized. Amen. Matter of fact, he was the opposite of being in water. He was dehydrated from the sun and from the uh, 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 crucifixion and the blood loss. Hey, he didn't have a drop of water hardly in him. It's not the water in the water main, it's the blood in Emmanuel's veins. Amen. Amen. Out goes number three, wonders. You don't find this man speaking in tongues. You don't find him seeing visions. You don't find the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You just find a man who got saved by the grace of God, minus works, minus wonders, and minus water. You see what God's trying to do? He's trying to tell everybody how to get saved. And then there's no worship either. Now, worship is good. I believe if you got a, the right kind of salvation, it'll bring you to church. Yep. I believe that. There'll be something in you that wants you to come to the house of God. But I tell you this, coming to the house of God won't make you saved. Yeah. Now, you can get saved in the house of God, just like we had four folks saved last Sunday. And well, I believe we're going to have more saved this morning. I really do. I feel it in my spirit. Amen. Right now. Amen. But I will tell you this, you don't come to church to get saved. You come to church to hear the gospel of how to get saved, but church does not save you. Right. Church is not going to make you a Christian. Church is where you ought to be, but it's not going to make you a Christian. Any more than being in a garage makes you a car. Right? right. Or riding the back of a cow makes you a milk jug. <laughs> it ain't going to work. It establishes the path of salvation. Number two, it establishes the permanence of salvation. Notice again, it says this, Today shalt thou. Now let me stop and say this. Jesus dies first. Do you remember that? Yeah. The other two men had to have their legs broke to die. So that tells me they were around after Jesus died. By the way, they knew when he died. They heard him say, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then it was gone. He was done. So this man's now left for a period of time to where he is still experiencing pain. His Savior is now dead. Something you and I have never had to experience. But he did. So could you agree with me that his faith might just waver? That during one of the terrible cramps when, when he's hanging on the cross, that maybe at some point then there might have been some pain and he might have said a bad word? And still yet, what did Jesus tell him? Today shall die. Yeah. Can I tell you, when you get saved, thank God you're saved for all of eternity. Amen. The Bible says you're in the palm of the hand of God and no man can open his hand. The Bible says I have graven thee upon the palm of my hand. The Bible says you are sealed until the day of redemption. And I sure am glad that when I got saved, I didn't get saved on my merit. I won't stay saved on my merit. I got saved by the grace of God, and I'm sealed by the Spirit of God, Amen. according to the Word of God. And Jesus confirms that here. There's no room for error on that. And then lastly, we find a consolation. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with who? Me. Me in paradise. Can you imagine the last thing this man experiences is his hands and feet being impaled with rusty Roman nails. His body's wrapped in pain, <coughs> cramping and smothering. And then the next thing he knows, he's walking arm in arm with Jesus in paradise. <laughs> now I don't know about you, and I like to think about what's in heaven and what heaven looks like, but I'm going to be honest with you, it really doesn't matter. Because what matters is who's there. Yep. Can you imagine? One minute, he's dying on the cross at Calvary. The next minute, his life is gone and he wakes up in heaven and there's Jesus. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. And there he sees the very Savior that had already promised him, for today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I don't know about you, but I bet he just ran right up to him and began to hug him and began to thank him and began to tell him how much he appreciated having grace with him even at that moment when he deserved to die and go to hell after all he had done. Not one work could he do. Not one thing could he do but put his trust and his faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. Amen. There was a man one time and he was 
trying to explain to his neighbor in his garage how what heaven was like. And he, and he kept trying to explain it to him, and he couldn't quite come up with the right words. His wife had come home from work, going in the front door. That, he had a little dog that just loved him, a little pet dog. And she went in there and let him out of the room, and he came, came running through the house. And out of absolute instinct, he knew where his master was at. He ran to where the door was and went into the garage, and he began to scratch on the door trying to get in because he wanted to be in there with his master. So the man reached over and unlocked the door, and in came that little dog, and he sat down. That dog jumped up in his lap and just licked him until his lips were flapping up and down, and I mean, just licked his face all over, slobber everywhere. And he was, you know, you know how the little dogs are. And that man said, you know what? That's what heaven's going to be like. And he said, the man said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, he said, when my little dog was outside of the garage, he said, and he was scratching on that door, he wasn't trying to get in because of the way the garage looked. Right. He wasn't trying to get in because of the windows that I put in this garage. He wasn't trying to get in because of the way the floor has been laid out. He wasn't trying to get in because of the lighting. He wasn't trying to get in because of the way I've decorated this place. He was trying to get in because he knew that's where his master was at. Amen. All he wanted to do was see his master. Amen. All he wanted to do was be there with his master. And he said, I'll tell you this. He said, I ain't the least bit concerned about the walls of Jasper or the street of gold or the gate of pearl or the gates of pearl. He said, I'm not concerned about any of the jewels and all the things that are up there. I'm not concerned about my mansion. He said, I just want to go and be where my master's at. I don't know about you, but I sure am looking forward to the day when I'll be with him. Not just because of what heaven is, because he's there in heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to going up to him and saying thank you for dying for me. Amen. And thank you for suffering for me. Yeah. And thank you for saving me when I deserve nothing but hell. Amen. I don't know about you, but I sure am glad. I, I'm going this morning. Are you? Amen. Are you going? Are you 100% sure that if you died right now, you're going to heaven? Margie, will you begin to come and play? And I want everybody just to stay seated just for a second. Are you sure that that's where you're going to be? This man was sure he, he, he was sure that's where he was going. God told him that's where he was going. Are you sure? Now I want to have you just bow your hands and close your eyes. Nobody's looking around. Now if you're 100% sure if you died right now, you go to heaven. There's no question in your mind. You know you put your faith and trust in Christ just like that thief did. You're not counting on works or water or anything. But you're just simply counting on Christ. <laughs> To get you to heaven, you know you're saved today. On count of three, slip your hand up on your heart. Thank you. Put your hands down. Now, if you're here today and you're not 100% sure you're saved, if you died right now and with an honest heart, you could not say, Preacher, I know I'm going to heaven. I, if you don't know today and you're not sure, hello, my name is Charles Barrier, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church here in Pennington Gap, Virginia. Thank you for joining us today. I hope the message that you just heard was both inspiring and a help to you in many ways. I want to take just a moment before we depart to ask you a very important question. And the question is this, are you 100% sure that you're saved, that you're going to heaven when you die? If you're not, that is a very important question that you need to answer. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 9 and 27, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. If you don't know 100% for sure that you're saved, the good news is the Bible says you can be. In 1 John 5 and 13, the Bible says this, These things have I written unto you, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. You say, how do I know that I've got eternal life? Well, you've got to come to this agreement that you're a sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3 and 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says also that there's a sentence for your sin. In Romans 6 and 23, it says the wages of sin is death. Now, there are two types of death in the Bible. There's an earthly death, but there's also something far worse, and that is an eternal death. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14 that the Bible says this, Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. This is a death that is perpetual and goes on throughout all eternity. 
It's a death where you don't burn up, but where you burn as a payment for your own sins. But here's the good news. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said this, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, if you know that you're a sinner and you know that you need to be saved and you're not 100% for sure that you're going to heaven, the Bible says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe that he was buried and that he arose again on the third day? If you do, then you believe the gospel. That is the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the next step is this. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you ready to take that step right now? Are you ready to turn from your sin and turn to the Savior and ask Jesus Christ to save you? If you are, then right now where you're at would be a great time to do that. Now, if you don't know what to pray, I would like to help you with that. Because it's not a magical prayer that saves you, but many people are oftentimes uncomfortable with praying a particular prayer or just not knowing how to pray. So maybe you would like to pray something like this with me from the very bottom of your heart. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. Jesus, will you please forgive me for my sins, wash me in your blood, and save my soul from hell, and be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Now, if you did pray just right then and there and ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, and you meant it from the very bottom of your heart, we would love to help you in your new walk with the Lord. We would like for you to call the number that is on the screen and leave us a message and let us know that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Leave us an address, a phone number, so that we could contact you. We would like to send you a Bible and some materials to help you in your walk with Christ. And we would like to rejoice with you. And we thank you for joining us today. Goodbye.